Hi there. Thank you for listening to the Praying Christian Women podcast. I am Alana and my friend and co-host Jamie is here. Today we are going to be talking about how to pray for your unsaved friends and family members. This is a topic that has been just real close to my heart and Jamie's heart and we are so glad to be able to discuss it with you guys today. So let's open up with a word of prayer. God, thank you for this day and just for this topic that is applicable to every single one of us. We all know somebody that doesn't know you, and we just pray that today you would help us just to be encouraged and inspired to be just fervent prayers and advocates and just to stand in the gap for these people that we care about um, or even people that that haven't even come to our mind that you have in mind for us to be praying faithfully for, that they would come to know you. God, we just pray that you would um, be present here and be glorified today in our episode. In Jesus' name, amen. Our verse of the day today is John 6, 37. It says, all those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. And I think going into this conversation about praying for unsaved friends and family members, I think all of us or some of us might just have questions about, well, you know, there are debates about predestination and Calvinism and Arminianism, and we're not here to get into that today. What we're here to get into is the fact that all who come to Jesus, he will never drive away. And and we want to focus on that and just really go into this with open minds and hearts to who God wants for us to be committing our time and our our prayers to, to, to just pray that their eyes would be open to who God is and and to enter into a saving relationship with Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. So, so our, I'll go. <laughs> so, so Paul, start. <laughs> I'll do it. Let me pick me. You get to do the fun thing today. Our just for fun question is, how old were you when you were saved? So I have like a uh, – I don't have a date. You know, some people have a date in yeah, their Bible. I and I don't have a date – I know that when I was young, I had this idea that maybe it didn't take the last time. And so I Uh would just like pray the prayer every time just to make sure. And so I I just kind of normal. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just like, God, I just, yeah, I I commit my life to you again. Uh But I do know that, you know, and I could, you can never know. I believe firmly that I was saved as a child, but then, you know, I fell away from God in practice for a while, but even throughout that time, I still had a knowledge of who he was and I still prayed to him and I talked to him and, you know, uh, but I, I recommitted my life to Christ in college. And again, I did kind of the, Hey, if it wasn't real before, this is it, man, I want you to be the Lord of my life. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't have a date, but I would say, I believe firmly it was as a child, like in my young childhood. Yeah. For me, it's a little interesting because I was, you know, I, I prayed the prayer and, you know, grew up in a Christian home, definitely, you know, had a child's knowledge of Jesus from super early on. And then I remember being 12 and going to a youth group retreat, which is when I really realized that God loved me personally. And it went from just, I go to church because my parents say I should to, wow, God loves me. He wants a personal relationship with me. I don't have to be an adult in order to, you know, have a vibrant walk with God on my own. And so sometimes when people ask me when I was saved, I say 12. Sometimes I say when I was little or, you know, so it's just a little interesting. The terminology doesn't always fit, you know, like at 12, was that a recommitment? Was that a, you know what I mean? Like, it's just a little bit, um, weird, you know, well, yeah. I like, is it Corey Tenboom who has the analogy of the train? I don't know. I haven't heard it. Tell me. Okay. It's something like sometimes you're in a train. I'm going to totally botch this. That's why I wish you would remember it. <laughs> it. The gist of it is, you know, the, the takeaway is, yeah, some people have an exact moment where they know absolutely they were not saved before that moment. And then they were saved. And for other people, she talks about like getting on a train and maybe dozing off and, you know, not really paying attention to your surroundings and all of a sudden realizing you're at your destination. And, you know, so she talks about sometimes it's 
salvation in an instant. And sometimes you just can look back and be like, okay, I totally believe in God. Don't know when it happened. Um, you know, I always think it's interesting to think about like, when is that exact moment of salvation? You know, like if I had died the day before I went to that youth camp, I'm, I'm still sure I would have gone to heaven. You know what I mean? But it's just, it's interesting that whole, um, there's a word for it. I forget my husband would know, but just like the study of salvation, you oh, know, like I think so that, it's an ology word. <laughs> it is. And you know, the way I look at it, I always picture us and our timeline as like a thread in a room. And it's, you know, there's a beginning, there's an end, and we're on the thread from beginning to end. And I picture God as like the air in the room. He's around it all. And so I picture that it doesn't matter that time, like we're, we've always been saved. And if we're saved, and, and I think that is independent of the debate of predestination or not. I think the the bottom line is God knows who's going to and, and when he's all knowing. And so I think the way that we get there, there's definitely a lot that goes into that and prayers are absolutely a part of that. But I kind of think that like we've, if we are going to be saved at some point, we've always been saved. I don't know. Does that make sense at all? It does. I think I sort of disagree in that. Like I get what you're saying that if, if God has, God knows that you're going to be saved, he's kind of not going to let you die (laughs) until you do it but I still feel like the theoretical like yeah there is a point where you know I think maybe it's slightly different for those of us who grew up in Christian homes and you know like if one of my kids died before we like formally heard them say a prayer I still would have trusted that they would be in heaven I think that's slightly different but especially for like an adult who comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus as an adult Mm -hmm. I do feel like there is a sense of if I had died before this time, I would have gone to hell, you know, I don't know. (laughs) Right. No. But then, and then at that point, it would have always been that way. I don't know. But yeah, I I know what you mean. It it is. It's super confusing and we do not know. And that's why we don't want to get into the theology of what you believe in terms of Right. This isn't the theology of salvation. It is not. Uh, just that is for a different the, podcast of someone else's. But we, absolutely. We I'm not volunteering to, for that one. <laughs> me neither. But we just we are very passionate though about the fact that prayer does influence the salvation and God has given us this gift and this like partnership with him and seeing his power unleashed in the lives of these people that we care about. And we do have a responsibility and we are called to it. For sure. Yeah. I feel like I, I want to touch on one more of the theology things before we jump into praying for the unsaved. Mm-hmm. And that is, there's this passage in Matthew, which, you know, is one of the more obscure ones, but it convicts me, like, to the degree, like, I don't know that there are any other verses that convict me more reading it. And it talks about how Jesus is talking to these cities that refuse to believe in him. And he said, if the miracles that had been performed in you had been performed in like Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented. Wow. And the way I see that is there are some people that God knows could have been saved if something had, if they had seen something, if they had heard Mm. something. So the question of predestination and all that aside, there are some people who, if they were prayed for enough, if they were witnessed to enough, would be saved and who were not, you know, like Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. Yet Jesus himself says, if they had seen these miracles, they would have repented. Wow. And yeah, like that convicts me to no end because I think we could tie that into prayer hey, if you had prayed for Sodom and Gomorrah more, maybe they would have been saved, you know? And so sometimes I feel like we can get kind of callous and just say, well, God's going to save who he's going to save. It's not up to me, so whatever. And if you happen to end up in hell, well, too bad. Nothing could have changed your mind. And that, I mean, that we've got that verse. (laughs) Sodom and Gomorrah ended up, you know, being destroyed in a very hell-like way. And Jesus himself says, if circumstances had been different, they would not have perished. Yeah. And so, you know, there are people who are going to go to hell who would have been saved if they had 
heard you know like if something had changed and that is crazy to think about and so convicting it is and it can be overwhelming so hopefully in yeah. this you know there's such a balance to be struck to keep us from becoming paralyzed and just throwing up our hands and giving up because it is a heavy topic i just remember shortly after i recommitted my life to christ and thinking about theology and thinking about salvation and thinking about the reality of hell, which I had never really thought about. The fact that Jesus is clear that not all are going to end up there. And there are even those that think they're going to be there and he's going to say, I never knew you. Mm -hmm. And that I cried. I mean, I just sobbed and I thought, how can that be? And, and what do I do now? Like that was my thought, like, what do I do now? How can I, save all of them, you know, because I'm a fixer. Yeah. And so if you're listening to this podcast, you have a heart for prayer. And so the last thing that we want to do is overwhelm you to the point of keeping you from praying. So this episode is about how do we pray for our unsaved friends and family in a way that is answering the call that God has obviously put on our lives to intervene through prayer but without being overwhelmed and paralyzed. Yeah, without being overwhelmed and also without taking too much responsibility. Yeah. Um, Jamie, you and I were talking this morning. I was telling you about this book I'm reading by the Strobels and how she was saved several years before he was and just the tension that caused in their marriage. And it's written for people in a spiritual mismatch is what they call it. Mm -hmm. And, um, they talk about how a lot of times wives are made to feel incredibly guilty for the fact that their husbands aren't saved to the point where people might even say something like, well, if you were just a better witness or if you just prayed harder, your husband would have been saved by now. And nope, that is between that individual and the Lord. Our prayers make a huge difference. And I firmly believe our prayers can change the eternal destiny for people. Mm -hmm. But we also need to, so there's this balance of having the encouragement to know, yes, my prayers do make a difference. I'm not just, you know, sending out nonsense to a predetermined world where everything's going to happen the way it would have happened anyway. You know, so recognizing, yeah, my prayers are, can possess the power and do possess the power to change history and change someone's eternal destiny, but still recognizing that it's not up to you. You know, like it's, it's almost paradoxical. I feel like there's a really fine line that's not a paradox. And if you go on either end, you're into the realm of paradox. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. Um, well, one of the kind of stories that, that is has been encouraging to us as we've discussed this is the story of George Mueller. And, you know, most people think of George Mueller, at least I did. I think you brought this story to my attention, mm -hmm. Alana. And I think of George Mueller as the guy that prayed for orphans and had milk trucks break down in front of the orphanage to provide food and, you know, stuff for the orphans. But a really neat story is that he um, began praying for just five people in November of 1844. And he said that he prayed for every single day for these five people. And he was interviewed toward the end of his life and said that, you know, after 18 months, the first one of those five came to know the Lord. It was then five years before the second came to the Lord and then six years for the third. And the last two toward the end of his life were not yet Christians. And he said, but I hope in God, I pray on and I look yet for the answer. They are not converted yet, but they will be. How could it be any other way? And the last two were sons of friends from school or sons of a friend from school. And he had prayed by the end of his life, he had prayed for 52 years for their conversion. And um, they actually, after his death, those two, um, those two sons ended up becoming Christians um, so it was after he died, you know, the, the remnants and the ripple effects of those prayers had their effect. And, the, and, and by the end, all five of those people came to the Lord. And to put things into perspective, um, I don't know how they came up with this estimate, but by one account, they had estimated 30,000 people were estimated to have come to the Lord, both orphans and other people that were influenced by George Mueller. But it was these five 
that were on his like long term, like long haul prayer list, just mm-hmm. five, but every single one of them came to the Lord. So that's encouraging in so many ways. In so many ways, it would have been easy for him to have stopped after like even a month <laughs> or, or a year or let's call it a decade. <laughs> yeah. And he didn't. And that's amazing persistence in prayer, which, you know, is one of the first takeaways for me. I know, Jamie, you and I talked about this a couple years ago, even, and, the, and you know, and just how we were both convicted by this story. Mm-hmm. And so Jamie and I made this commitment that we want to encourage you listening to make to it if you feel called to it. And that is to pick one to five people that you are just going to commit to pray for daily for their salvation until you die, they die, or they're saved. And, you know, hopefully even after they're saved, you would continue to pray for them. But to realize, hey, we're in this for the long haul, you know, and I feel like that degree of persistence has so much power. You know, imagine being George Mueller during those decades of silence. You know, imagine him, all the excuses he could have made, Mm -hmm. but he didn't. And, you know, you've talked about how he's, he's a man of great faith. And, you know, in the meantime, he was seeing God do amazing things in other ways. And obviously other people were coming to know Christ through him in other ways. Mm -hmm. I think that along the way, God, God revealed to him step by step, Hey, I am here. I am powerful. I am at work. Yeah. So, you know, another encouragement is as you're praying for these people, look for, um, you know, look for ways that God is at work around that person or even in other circumstances that you're praying for just for inspiration as you go. Because it is tempting to say, oh, I guess maybe that person is just not somebody that that I need to keep praying for. Maybe that person is just, you know, a lost cause or, Mm -hmm. you know, after 10 years. But, But start looking for things around that person or in, in other areas, just for inspiration and reminders from God that he's still at work, even if we can't see it or sense it. Yeah. I've got a slight side story that eventually I'm going to tie into prayer. So my 12 year old and I have been talking a lot about art because he is super interested in graphic design and is considering going into business, selling book covers, you know, and even at 12, he's already sold a few. And we've talked a lot about rejection and how what distinguishes really a successful artist from the artist who gives up isn't really the degree of talent. You know, like, yeah, you should probably have a tiny bit of talent, but you can learn skills too, you know. And I would say, like, for most people making a living from their art, it has way more to do with just persistence and commitment and not giving up. And so I talked to him, you know, because as an author, we talk a lot in the author community about, you know, rejections and stuff like that. And, you know, how many rejection letters did such and such famous author get from publishing houses and things. And there was one point in my, in the early, early author stages where I had a goal that I wanted to get a hundred rejection letters because that would mean that I was, you know, definitely not giving up. And so I told that to my son and, and he liked that idea, you know, of, oh yeah, well maybe I can make a hundred covers that aren't going to sell, but imagine how much better he'll be after making those, you know? Um, yeah, can you that's imagine, really... like I, I can't ever say that I have prayed for something for 10 years without wavering and it still hasn't happened. I'm not even sure I've done it, you know, maybe a year max of praying kind of on and off. Mm -hmm. But I mean, how much would I love to be able to say, yeah, 10 years from now that I have been praying for this person's salvation. They're still not saved, but I haven't given up, you know? And you know, I like to think a lot of times about what could happen if we could part the veil of reality and see yeah. in the spirit world what is actually happening, mm-hmm. you know, and I kind of imagine sometimes if I need inspiration, I'll just imagine that I'm just about to the tipping point and I think, you know what, what if 
what if that person is just about to, you know, yeah. have a breakthrough and I give up mm-hmm. now and I stop right. to, and it's just about to happen. And, you know, I think of when my kids and I, if, when our family goes hiking and the little ones tend to complain because they're littler, their feet are mm-hmm. short, their feet are shorter. Their, their feet are short. Well, they are short. They are feet. short. <laughs> <laughs> their legs are shorter and, you know, they, they're the ones that complain first. And I just keep saying, well, just around the next corner, you know, we don't have that much farther to go. And it really does. When you think the end is just about in sight, it gives you that burst of inspiration. And so I do think, you know, if we could see the real effect of the things that we're doing and and the real effect of our prayers. And sometimes we do get the benefit of seeing that God gives us glimpses of, oh, wow, that person just got a job and they just mentioned that their partner is, you know, a Christian or they were invited to church. You know, we see those little glimpses and that spurs us on to pray and it's encouraging. But even when we don't see that, if we could just imagine, like just imagine that the veil is parted and you can see that that person is just around the corner from breakthrough and that we just need to get them through to that next place. I think that's really helpful because it, it probably is the case that, you know, persevering, that, that those things are happening, that those turning yeah. points are coming around at every corner. You know, I'm a huge fan of letting your imagination kind of spur your prayers. And I think that a really effective way to pray for this is just imagine the person and what they would be like as an on fire believer, mm-hmm. you know, and just let that fuel your kind of prayer energy, like let that inspire your prayers. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily that like you're getting this downloaded image direct from God that he's promising this is exactly what it will look like. It truly is imagination, but I feel like it can really inspire and fuel your prayers. Like if this person got saved, like imagine and, and they, had this passion for Christ, imagine what their life would look like. Imagine talking to them, sharing, you know, praises about God and things like that. And in my mind, that's a really neat way to just go from rote prayers where you're kind of just saying the same thing over and over, like, dear God, please help so-and-so to be saved Mm -hmm. to really just exciting prayers. Yeah. And specific prayers, you know, I know that, uh, you know, as we're preparing for this, one of the things that you really wanted us to, to cover is to pray for specifics. And, you know, do you want to kind of elaborate on some of the, the specific ways that we can get into praying for? Yeah. So I'll save so-and-so. Right. So I'm going to back up to when you and I heard the story of George Mueller and both felt, oh, well, we, we want to be praying more effectively for our unsaved friends. Mm -hmm. And at that point, most of my prayers were the kind of rote things that I just mentioned, you know, help so-and-so be saved. That'd be great. Thanks. (laughs) Thanks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so um, as an author, what I ended up doing was putting together 30 different prayers to pray. And each one kind of covers a different topic, you know, so like praying for divine encounters, praying for them to be convicted of sin, you know, praying for them. Like a lot of people have things that if they were to be saved, they would have to give up. So praying that they would be willing to make those sacrifices, things like that. And so we put this together and turned it into an email sequence. So you can go to prayingchristianwomen.com slash unsaved. And then for the next 30 days, you'll get an email with a prayer and a little kind of devotional with a lot of scripture actually that can help you pray more specifically because that was my biggest problem was going from help them be saved thanks to you know praying more thoroughly and more specifically yeah and i think that um that is also just in itself kind of an inspiration to pray specifically and um I guess as we're talking about, you know, we're talking about specifically praying for unsaved friends and family. So you probably know these people pretty well. You kind of know what their struggles are, what their life is like. And, and so, you know, in addition to using this 30 days of prayer, 
um, there are probably other very specific things that you can know to pray about. So just even brainstorming, you know, the, I, the, the specifics within the specifics, you know, so uh-huh. if one of the 30 days is to pray for relationships that they have, you know, think about those specific relationships and, you know, whether they have people in their lives that are Christians or mm-hmm. if they don't praying specifically that God would place those people there. And I don't know, things like that, but it, it does, it makes prayer more exciting because when you pray more specifically, then it just gives God that many more opportunities, you know, or I guess I should say it gives us that many more opportunities to see God working in very specific right. ways to answer those prayers that we might not have thought of otherwise. Mm-hmm. So that's why I love that 30 days of prayer series because it really, it fuels the excitement in, in just anxious expectation for what God can do. Yeah. 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 So I I would say another word of caution, like I love how George Mueller just had five people on his list Mm -hmm. because if I were George Mueller and we're seeing so many answers to so many prayers, I would be like, oh, well, let me put 500 people on my list. You know, the more the merrier. Mm -hmm. But we've talked before about, you know, sometimes you do have to focus on praying for a few things thoroughly as opposed to just giving blanket prayers for a bunch of stuff. And that's where I fell into this trap. I was doing pretty good because Jamie and I made this commitment commitment to each other that we, we were going to make this a daily prayer habit. And I did that well for months. And then I just kept getting more and more excited and adding more and more people. And it got to the point where I looked at this list of like 20 different people and just got overwhelmed And so I felt kind of bad, but I knew I had to take it back down. So now my list of daily prayers for the unsaved, and to be honest, I haven't gotten back into the habit as well as I was, but I'm down to two. And that doesn't mean that I don't pray for the others occasionally, but in terms of just making this a daily commitment, you know, don't go overboard or or you can get overwhelmed. Yeah. And you know, I think also just being being sensitive to God's leading, because I think there could be times when he's leading us to focus on on a certain ones as opposed to others, probably based on what they're going through in their lives and what, you know, the 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 urgency or the spiritual battle that's happening in their lives. And so to go into it, asking God, you know, praying ahead of time, God, bring to mind these you know, the ones that you want me to pray for on that ongoing Mm -hmm. basis. You know, I think that's, that's definitely important, but yeah, it was a lot easier when, when we record and we're, you know, talking about the unsaved people in our lives and things like that. It does, it is more of a reminder. And I have with the stretch that we weren't recording together, I I have Mm -hmm. gotten back away from praying as faithfully for the people. Yeah. that were on my list. So yeah, that was that's okay. Problem. And that's okay. Don't be discouraged. Don't look at that and say, oh, I, I've, I've blown it now. I'm not going to pray for anybody anymore. Um, you know, just be very free to jump back on and just start praying again. Yeah. I was reading this book. It has nothing to do with prayer, but it's all about setting goals. Mm -hmm. And he talked about like setting goals for each week and how, even if you only make, like he really recommends scoring yourself at the end. So like, let's say your goal was, you know, I want to write five chapters this week and you only write four. So you give yourself 80%. Um, Yeah. (laughs) I had to check my math. That was kind of embarrassing. (laughs) But you know, he said that 85% or higher is still really, really good. Like basically you're going to meet your big term goals if you can do that. And for me, I'm such an all or nothing person, Mm -hmm. but it was actually very encouraging for me. Like I'm doing a few things. I'm using his kind of, um, structure of goal setting to do some things to, to get healthier. And for me, like I might've stopped three weeks ago when I dipped down to, oh, I only did 95% of these things this week, Mm -hmm. you know, but just realizing, Hey, 80, 85% is okay. And still is going to have results. So sometimes I think that I treat God as if he's up there with a little chalkboard and tallies Mm -hmm. and saying, okay, she needs to pray for this person 365 days in a row. And then maybe I'll do something, you know? And so if I skip a day, I almost feel like I'm starting all the way back at the beginning when really any, like there's not such thing as a wasted prayer. 
Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so even if you're not doing this a hundred percent of the time, each time you do pray for these people, it's bringing them closer to like what you mentioned, that tipping point, which I think is a neat way to look at it. Well, and I think also one of the things that I do is I, I think, and it's, it's a big prayer block. It is looking at God as our adversary and like, we have to convince him, like, oh, I've mm-hmm. got to convince God to save this person. When, I mean, going back to John six thirty seven, all of those that the father gives me will come to me. Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. God wants, you know, and there, there's a verse that talks about God desires that all would come to him, you know, and mm-hmm. if one of the missing is, has gone off one of the 99 sheep, you know, that he'll, he'll go off for that one. God's heart is for salvation. So we are partnering with God. And I think one of my biggest blocks when it comes to praying for the unsaved friends and family is that I look at it as I somehow need to convince God that he needs to do something when he's inviting us into his lavish grace and love. You know, he's inviting us into his will. He wants his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it already is in heaven. And I think once we shift that, like you said, rather than just thinking, oh, I've got to do all these things to get up to the threshold where he'll work. You know, he's just, he's waiting for, um, for those opportunities to, to make what he already wants to happen, happen. And so I don't know that for me, that, that block is, looking at God as our partner and our, That's neat. Our, our, not our adversary. Yeah. Well, you know, I want to talk about prayer blocks a tiny bit, you know, cause we have our, our course or our prayer retreat on prayer blocks. And we also, I feel like there are different prayer blocks that specifically prevent us from praying for the unsaved. Like for me, some of it was, well, why would I pray for this person and not for that person? That doesn't sound fair, you know, which is how I ended up with a, a list of over two dozen names that just got mm-hmm. too overwhelming. But, you know, this is an interesting prayer block that I feel like I've gotten into before. And it's, well, if I pray really fervently, like if I make it a commitment to every single day pray for this person, God's probably going to make me be the one to have to confront them about their salvation. And and that feels weird and awkward to me. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel kind of scared. Like, you know, sometimes people are scared of praying for patience because the joke is that, you know, God's going to, you know, make terrible things happen. He'll give it to you. Just don't even, don't even pray. Almost like, you know, yeah. And that one's turned almost into a joke, but for this one, it's actually like, I do know that this is a prayer block of mine. Mm -hmm. Like I feel better praying for people to be saved that don't live near me and that I don't have an everyday connection with Mm -hmm. because I do feel scared that once I start praying for them, then God's going to turn and point his finger at me and say, okay, Alana, now it's your turn. And I shouldn't be scared of that. Like I, I hate that that's part of my mindset. Yeah. And I'm right there with you. I I don't know. I know a few people that love evangelism and that's Mm -hmm. their gift. And, but we are all called to, to, to share the gospel. And most people I know are in the camp that we're in where it is intimidating and scary to, Mm -hmm. to be the evangelist. It's more comfortable for some of us to be the prayers. Um, But yeah, yeah, like you said, go to him and pray with a willing heart and, and look for opportunities to be that, mm-hmm. that you know, another the oh, answer to your own prayer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think that as you're praying for that person so fervently, I think God's going to be working in your heart too, mm-hmm. to make you more excited and willing to share, you know, kind mm-hmm. of like, it's hard to stay mad at someone that you're praying for. Like it's hard to not want to witness to someone that you're praying regularly for, but it still can be scary. But you know, here's another prayer block that I've heard of. Um, When I first heard it, I kind of laughed like, oh, well, that's kind of silly, but I feel like this really could trip people up. And someone said, oh, well, I, I know that I'm supposed to pray for this person to be saved, but I just feel so bad praying for it because I know that most of the time for someone to be saved, God has to make their life really miserable. And so I feel like I'm kind of cursing them by Mm -hmm. asking God, you know, like if you know that there's somebody who in order for them to come to God is going to have to go through some kind of hard Mm -hmm. or traumatic experience, or at least you believe that that's the case, I can see you feeling bad. Like you love this person, almost like a, a prodigal child 
who would want to see their kid go through something horrific? Right. You know, even if it did result in salvation, you want them to just skip to the part where they're saved and happy and safe and well. You don't want them to have to go through this. Um, Was that a prayer block that you've experienced personally praying for your unsaved friends? Well, when you mention it about kids, I have, it's crossed my mind when I pray for my kids and I'm like, God, I just pray that they would come to know you at any cost, you know, and, and two things have crossed my mind. One is that me dying is going to be <laughs> like a trial that's going to Aww. cause them. And I think, but I want to be there for them. I'm not afraid to die, but I'm afraid of not being here to do what, of course, I feel like I'm the only one that can do for my kids. So I think, well, you know, somehow me suffering or dying is going to be something that God uses to draw them to himself. Or if I pray for them that, like you said, it has crossed my mind. What if it's going through a trial that has to draw them? That has crossed my mind. It's not something that was ever in the forefront of my mind. Mm -hmm. But now that you mentioned that, those things just flash through my head sometimes when I'm like, am I really, it's counting the cost. Am I willing to pray that God would draw them close to himself at any cost? And, and right. Yeah. I think the flip side could be true too. What if there's someone in your life that is not saved that it's like Jonah and Nineveh, where you don't want them. You don't feel like they deserve salvation. You're kind of like, hey, you're the most horrible person I know. Yeah. What about enemies, you know? And like, hey, I don't want you to be blessed. I don't want to see that person who's terrible and horrible and hurt me or hurt someone I love in such a horrible way to ever receive God's grace. And oh, so I absolutely. wonder if that could be another yeah. block. I had this dream once, and it was very, very vivid. And I had this dream where someone had kidnapped my children and I was totally confronting them. Like I was, I I, truly in my dream, I was filled with the Holy spirit. And I was like, if you lay a hand on these little ones, like God is going to totally punish you. (laughs) But then, so, you know, first I'm, I'm kind of like, you know, filling this criminal who doesn't even exist. It's just my dream with like the fear of judgment. And (laughs) I've never talked to someone like that in real life. Like I was going on him, um, like, you know, little Holy spirit fireball. But then I said, But, you know, actually, if you ask God to forgive you, he would. And I'm not sure how I feel about that. That was actually what I said. (laughs) That is like a total like verbal. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. Like you hurt my kids. I want you to suffer God's wrath and judgment. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Well, we better wrap things up, but we just want to leave you guys with some inspiration to not give up praying for your unsaved friends and family. Mm -hmm. And if you would like this added resource we talked about to get these 30 emails, it's a free resource you can sign up for at prayingchristianwomen.com slash unsaved. Is there anything else you wanted to add, Jamie? No. I think we're ready for our blessing and benediction. All right. Well, here's your blessing. May God bless your relationships today. May your family and friends be blessed through you. May you enjoy sweet fellowship with others and may your friendships be blessed with love, trust, and laughter in abundance. May God use others to encourage, exhort, and instruct you. And may you enjoy meaningful relationships with others who will equip you to love more fully and live more abundantly. And our benediction is from 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen.